Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kyle Mox. I am the Associate Dean for National Scholarships at Arizona State University and Director of the Lorraine W. Frank Office of National Scholarships Advisement. And with me today is Dr. Lori Stoff. Hi, I am a faculty member uh, in Barrett, the Honors College. Uh, I'm a historian of Russia, Eastern Europe, women, war, and gender. And I am a faculty advisor for the Office of National Scholarship. And so I'm here to talk about the great opportunities you have for studying critical foreign languages. So uh, that's gonna be our emphasis today, our a range of fellowships that provide support for people who want to engage in study of what are considered critical foreign languages. And we'll unpack that statement in a little bit. Um, in terms of national scholarship, so my office, um, uh, the office that I, that I direct, Office of National Scholarships Advisement, what we're talking about are external awards for the most part. These are large uh, programs, usually sponsored by federal agencies or foreign governments. I think almost everything we're talking about today is actually sponsored by a federal agency. Mean, and that means that students from all over the country can be applying for these awards, which means that the applicant pools are quite large and therefore very competitive. Therefore, the university thinks it's a good investment of their money to have an office that exists to help uh, prepare you all to be really competitive applicants for these awards. Um, you know, because they are so competitive, prestige is a big component of these as well. So these are definitely awards you'd want to have on your resume or CV as you're moving on into employment or graduate study, things like that. Um, you know, they do, you know, they're very generous in most cases, but um, most of them have a very, um, very valuable experiential component to that, meaning that you actually get to travel somewhere or you get to be part of a cohort or a group or you're part of an alumni association and get access to federal hiring preferences and things like that. So the uh, extrinsic bonus you know, benefits of the programs are often, um, or I guess intrinsic benefits of the program are often more valuable than, than the simple cash awards. And so experience is a big component of most of the programs that we work with, which is why I often use the term fellowships in place of national scholarships. So um, in terms of what our office does, uh, the full title, Lorraine W. Frank Office of National Scholarships Advisement, uh, it, that's quite a mouthful. Most people just refer to us as ANSA. We exist to publicize awards, just like we're doing now. Um, but we also work to identify potential candidates for awards. Um, I, I have a strong belief that not only do we represent ASU and the students here, but we also, as the points of contact for these federal agencies, have an obligation to our country to find great candidates for these awards because they exist for very specific reasons. Um, we'll organize selection processes or nomination processes if these awards have them. Um, and we're here to guide you along the way on the application. So most applicants underestimate how much time they're going to be spending on these applications. Um, and once they get into process with Dr. Stoff or myself or one of the other advisors in our office, uh, we real, you know, the students and applicants begin to realize exactly how much development and work and ideation goes into this whole process, which is why, you know, I also consider us a, a sort of coach, right? We're here to motivate you and keep you moving, uh, keep your eyes on the prize and understanding that what you're doing for these fellowships applications is on top of all the other work that you're doing to keep yourself an amazing student at ASU. So uh, we're here to provide whatever support you need and answer any and all questions that you may have. Now, in terms of that term critical languages, what we mean by that are languages that are less commonly taught um, in the American Academy in American high schools. And so that generally means anything non-Western European. So English, German, Spanish, uh, French are not considered critical need languages. Most uh, Western European languages are not considered critical need. Um, it's a term that US government defines as languages where we are severely understaffed or undersubscribed in government service or employment. Um, and that means that these are countries that are highly relevant to US national interest, either because of their um, geopolitical position or the size of their population or, or, or other factors. Uh, part of it's related to national security, other parts are related to foreign policy. But if you just think about where the population dynamics are in the world, Indonesia's population growth is, is, is amazing, right? It's the most populous Muslim nation, um, predominantly Muslim nation in the world. How many Americans speak Indonesian or can't even, can't even find it on the map? Uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, um, most, uh, uh, some of the largest countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa are, are poised to be the most populous countries uh, within a generation, yet we don't speak any of those languages. So the government rather than, um, throwing money at the problem is throwing money at students, at people that want to be of service to our country, 
um, by developing proficiency in these less commonly taught languages. So chief among that uh, in that vein are the Boren Awards, uh, which is part of the National Security Education Program. Um, and what it does is provide funding for both undergraduates and graduate students to pursue these less commonly taught languages by immersive language study in, in the countries in which these languages are, are spoken. Um, locations are generally uh, what they would consider underrepresented in study abroad. So yes, um, you're, you're not gonna be going to Paris or Madrid uh, as a born scholar. You might be going to Amman, Jordan uh, or Seoul or uh, you know, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, again, most Americans could not find on a map. Uh, the awards are quite generous. The expectation for Boren awardees is that they're going to be going on um, uh, programs of significant length. And so the minimum amount of study for either the scholarship or fellowship, meaning either the undergraduate or the graduate version of this award, is 12 weeks. Um, their preference is 25 weeks or longer or six months or longer. They actually call that um, a year long. A program. About 80, 85 percent of the awards actually go to programs that are six months or longer. Now, if you're a STEM major, you are allowed to go for short-term summer uh, uh, programs, uh, with because you know they eventually did realize that we're not getting any STEM majors because they can't interrupt their um, uh, science and, and and mathematics sequences, right? Um, the award for that longer time period would be up to $25,000. They did just increase that this year. And so essentially what you're getting is a check to subsidize a uh, language focused study abroad program of your choosing. So you select the program. It can be an ASU program. It does not need to be an ASU program. Um, and then basically you're writing up the budget for that and they're agreeing to fund it. Uh, the graduate version uh, is for students where are about to be or are currently enrolled in a graduate program. It's slightly, it's essentially the same, but it has a lot more freedom in terms of, of program design. You do need to be a US citizen as this is a federally funded program um, and you do need to be currently enrolled. And one criterion that's a little bit confusing for a lot of people is the enrollment requirement. You need to be enrolled at ASU during your boring period. And this can be a little confusing uh, for uh, people that are about to are currently in their last year of undergraduate study. That does not present a problem. In fact, the majority of our recipients are graduating seniors. And what we simply do is uh, put you in uh, suspe suspended animation, so to speak. And we keep you on the books as a student at ASU until after your boring period. There's a small minimal fee that just gets rolled into your budget. Um, you can walk with your class, but you're, you're still our responsibility, which I think ultimately is what the Department of Defense is after there. Uh, graduate students need to remain enrolled. And so we just, you know, we can talk about your individual case there in terms of timing. Uh, graduate, uh, excuse me, there is the option for academic credit. And so uh, you will be enrolling in an actual study abroad program if you're an undergraduate student. And, um, you know, we can negotiate that and work with your advisors to make sure this works out in your best interest. There are, um, I keep moving windows around because I can't see everything all at once. So there are certain emphases on particular regions, languages, and fields of study. Those are um, articulated on the Boren website. Um, you know, they're, they're essentially looking for places and languages that are of interest to U.S. national security. Now, National security is very broadly defined by Boren, right? Um, I prefer to think of it more as global stability because a, a stable world, a, a, a prosperous world, a, a world where everyone is well-fed, well-educated and, and makes enough money um, is a safe world, right? So um, you could be somebody that does want to be an analyst for the CIA, be an area specialist for the CIA or somebody that wants to join the US military and actually work in counterterrorism. That's one example of national security, but we have many applicants who want to work for Department of State as foreign service officers, people that want to work for USAID and work in sustainable development, uh, people who want to you know, work in environmental research, global health, um, you know, econo development economics, all these things relate to national security. In simplest terms, your explanation for why you go to this country and study this particular language is to justify it to the average American voter why it's important and why they should care. Um, so I did see one question in the chat. Um, what if your grad program is, oh, sorry, what if your grad, that's flying around on me. So as we're typing, grad program is in the country of your target language. If you're studying Korean and your graduate program is at the uh, Seoul National University, 
Uh, yeah, no, you have to be enrolled at an American uh, based institution. So you could be based at, um, say, NYU Abu Dhabi. Um, I, would, I was going to say uh, Singapore, uh, Yale's uh, campus in Singapore, but they just shut that one up. So you can't be enrolled at a foreign university. So uh, the medical questions might be an individual one we can address later or uh, talk about that more in the uh, Q&A. Um, the one thing about the Bourne uh, Scholarship Program is it does have a service requirement, which if you are a strong candidate for the Bourne should be less of an of a, of a obstacle and more of an incentive. Uh, the majority of our strongest candidates are people who are planning to work in the federal service anyway. Um, it must be at least one year and it must be related to national security. And the way that they interpret that is if you're working in what they call the big four, meaning the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, or in the intelligence community, which is something like 17 different agencies, you are automatically considered working in national security. Um, you, you have to do it within three years of graduation and you can do other agencies. We've had people do Peace Corps. Um, you could work in other subordinate agencies. Um, we've there's even been born scholars who've gone and worked for NASA uh, and so we can collaborate with our Central Asian partners where a lot of rocket launches are, are occurring uh, at this point. Um, can you apply to do research in that language if you're a native speaker? Um, yeah, that might be an individual question, right? Um, in terms of what the concept is, but essentially for the boring scholarship, you are um, basically applying to fund an off the shelf study abroad program that is focused on language acquisition. So if you're going to that country and you're already fluent in it, unless you can demonstrate that you're going to become fluenter, um, then it would not be a viable candidacy. So um, they will um, help you with job search. They do have hiring fairs. They'll help you with your um, resume and application materials. And born scholars also receive um, substantial uh, consideration. They, they get veterans hiring preference in federal agencies. So you would be the first person who gets considered before the general applicant pool, which again, if you're going in that direction, um, if we're going in that direction, then yes, that, that's an incentive. Now, if you are a member of the ROTC, um, you get special consideration. Some of the other initiatives include uh, new area studies programs that they're doing. So they have special initiatives for African languages, Indonesian language, uh, South Asian languages, and Turkish. So if you're interested in studying any of these languages, I strongly encourage you to apply um, because these are areas where they're looking to invest extra money. Each of these initiatives also provides domestic pre-departure language study at a language training center in the US. And so you'll get some study in before you leave to go. In many of these cases, they've already determined your study location. And so that's one less thing for you to do as well. And then you can continue on into the spring if you choose to um, and do an internship or continue your language study or do some additional study or things like that. Now, I should have pointed out at the outset there are no language minimums for Boren. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm only in second year wall up right now. Um, no, um, many of these languages, it's simply not possible to get any previous study unless you happen to go to Wisconsin for the summer or something like that. So um, you can pick up a new language through Boren and that's really the point, right? These are critically understudied languages and so you can be starting at absolute zero. Now, if you are applying for some of this is going to sound like an oxymoron, but some of the more commonly taught, uncommonly taught languages like Arabic, Korean, Japanese, or Russian, um, you, you would probably be more competitive if you had some language study already done, particularly if you're coming from a school where they know that is available to you. Uh, one of the great features of ASU is that we do provide a lot of a training in a lot of different languages. So as I mentioned before, STEM majors may propose summer only programs and they can actually include uh, STEM based research projects within that. Um, there is special preference given to people who are currently participating in ROTC as well as students who are in language flagship programs. And we'll discuss this a little bit later, but ASU does host a uh, Chinese uh, flagship language program. So if you're a Chinese flagship student at ASU, um, you essentially get a really careful and um, preferential look from the national um, from the National Security Education Program. Um, 
this is one situation where nepotism is welcomed. So if you already are, you know, engaged with the Department of Defense, they are going to show favoritism towards you. So language flagship programs are DOD funded. ROTC is obviously DOD funded. Um, and as we, we were talking before, and there was a question sort of about research before, if you're a graduate student and you apply for a Boren Fellowship, you uh, can include pre-departure language study. And you can also design a research program within that. So the linguistic study that we were talking about in the chat could potentially be um, part of the program. But again, one of the things you need to demonstrate in the application is that there are expected language gains. And there are pretty clear formula for predicting language gains in particular languages. And so if it's a language you're already fluent in, that, that might not be as attractive. If maybe as an ancillary language or a related language or a completely different language, yeah, and you could also do linguistic research, enroll in classes, things like that. The application itself is pretty straightforward. Obviously, you need to get a language assessment. Uh, if you don't speak it at all, you can just say, I give up, um, nothing here. Uh, you put together a very simple budget, and there's two essays, transcripts, and then two or three letters of recommendation. The undergrads for the scholarship only need two, graduates for the fellowship need three, uh, we just always send three, right? I don't think we've ever sent an application that didn't have three letters of recommendation. So the third one is optional for undergraduates, but um, if we want to be competitive, um, we, we're going to go ahead and send all three. So um, seem to be some more questions here real quick. I'm not sure about the American uh, government worker title at all. I don't, I'm not sure I comprehend that question. Um, Significance of your preferred, yeah. So we'll talk about the essays here right now and hopefully that'll answer the question. Um, this is where ONSA comes in. We spend a lot of our time working with applicants on these essays. And um, about a year or two ago, they revised the structure of these essays uh, th and they're quite, uh, they're much easier now. And they're, because before you had to combine all three of these topics into one essay, uh, which was very challenging. The first essay is really explaining why this language and the country uh, is of national security significance. And I consider this like a Venn diagram. You know, there's your area of interest academically and intellectually. Um, there's this country and current events that are happening there. And then there's America uh, in terms of what America cares about. So in the center of that is the topic of this essay. So if you're an economics major and you want to study Russian and you want to go to Latvia, then maybe you should study something to do with economics in Russian speaking countries, which you know we've had applicants. We had a recipient who did that several years ago. He was really interested in the bias against Russian speakers in the Latvian banking system. So Russian, you know, historically Russian speaking people actually are discriminated against uh, in, uh, by the banks in Latvia. Um, he was gonna go work in the FBI in the economics crime division. It all made really good sense. The second essay is more of a personal statement. So it, this talks more about your own personal motivation, uh, what the relevant experiences you've had for this particular experience and what your aspirations are for a public service career. So um, that's more about where you talk about your past and your future. And again, that one's a bit more personal. So the first one's more of a position paper, maybe more of an op-ed piece. Uh, the second one's more of a personal narrative. Our campus deadline is right at the start of the spring term. So you could be working now. I, and I'll just tell you right now, as much work as you think you're going to get done over the holiday break, you are not. Um, so I would start working early. And you're welcome to send drafts of your materials uh, to me for feedback and review. Um, we do have uh, Canvas resources built in as well. So once I know that you started the application and you're working on it, I can get you plugged in with those. We do interview all of our candidates as part of the campus evaluation process. And those begin about a week after the deadline. There's a kind of a tight turnaround, particularly for the fellows uh, whose applications are due before the undergraduate scholars. You'll know uh, by the end of January if you're progressing, and then you'll get your final not notification in April. So um, we're going to transition just a moment and talk a little bit about what I call the baby born, not to diminish it, but it is um, in many ways a, a, a very similar program to the born, but different in some very significant ways. And Dr. Stopp is the primary advisor for that one, so she will share her expertise with you.
Yeah, so this program is uh, a summer program, a um, very intensive, fully immersive language program. It's also sponsored by the US Department of State. And it also has the intention of broadening the base of Americans who are studying and mastering critical foreign languages. So it has the same goals as the Boren, um, but it's a summer program. It's also open to students uh, studying any discipline, uh, but it is uh, important that you demonstrate that the language study that you are proposing is relevant to what you want to do in your future career. So uh, it's not just for fun, it is necessary to demonstrate that you need this language in order to be able to do all the wonderful things that you wanna do with your life. Sorry. So next slide, please. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Mox. <laughs> Forgot I was driving. <laughs> uh, so uh, okay. as I mentioned, this is an intensive, fully immersive uh, group-based foreign study. So you go to a country, a host country where you study with a cohort of um, fellow language students uh, in a very intensive eight to 10 week summer program. Uh, you spend three, four hours a day, usually in the mornings uh, in language classes. And then there are all kinds of amazing cultural activities that you do in the afternoon so that you are literally fully immersed in language study. Uh, you get uh, basically the credit equivalent to one full year of study. So you could stay here at ASU if it, we offer that language and study for a year, or you could do this in eight to 10 weeks and get the same amount of credit, which will be applied uh, to your transcripts. Uh, there are 15 different foreign languages that critical languages scholarships uh, offer these scholarships for. And unlike the Boren, there is no service requirement. Uh, it's no strings attached, uh, free money, uh, again, open to all majors, all levels of study, undergraduate and graduate. There are some uh, requirements for eligibility. However, you do need to be a US citizen like these other programs. You do need to be enrolled in a degree granting program, again, undergraduate or graduate at the time of your application. So again, it's okay if you're a graduating senior this year, you can still apply. You need to be 18 years or older by the start of the program. Uh, you can repeat uh, your experiences with CLS in a different language if you want for one, one more time. So if you get it once, you can do it a second time and then you're cut off. The program is actually really amazing. It covers almost all of your expenses, including domestic travel to and from uh, Washington DC where you will attend a pre-departure orientation about your host country. It includes all of the costs of the international travel to and from your host country, all the visa fees, the housing, the meals, all of those amazing cultural excursions that I mentioned um, before. And again, you can get academic credit for equivalent for about one year of study in the language. So I know that this is the question you were asking, what amazing languages can I study uh, through the critical languages? Uh, program. Uh, some of the languages do have prerequisites, but most of them don't. So you can study Azerbaijani, Bangla, Hindi, Indonesian, Persian, Punjabi, Swahili, Turkish, and Urdu with no prior uh, experience at all in the language. However, if you want to study Arabic, Korean, Portuguese, or Russian, you need to have an equivalent of one full year of academic study uh, or the equivalent uh, and CLS has certain measures that they will allow for equivalency. Uh, and if you wanna do Chinese or Japanese, you need two years uh, of previous study. So the application process is one where you do fill out an online application. Unlike the BORN, there's no nomination. There's no interview process that you have to go through. Uh, you can only apply for one language at a time. So it's very important that you choose the language that you can demonstrate the most critical need for your achievement of your professional goals. 
Um, you need one letter of reference, and this is extremely important to pick your referee carefully. Make sure it's someone who can really write about you as a person who knows you very well, not the most prestigious person in your field that you attended class with 500 other people and has no idea who you are, not Michael Crow just because he has a name, right? Someone who really knows you well. Uh, you also will be required to write four very short essay responses between 250 and 400 words asking you about your resilience, your uh, language preparation, your ability to be a cultural ambassador for the United States, uh, your contributions to the program, and then ultimately a longer 500 word statement of purpose where you demonstrate again the critical need for studying this language in order for you to accomplish your goals. And those goals really should be something aligned with international development, foreign service, national, uh, international diplomacy, something that's going to serve the interests of the US and the world generally. So as far as the timeline for the CLS program, the application will open in early October. We're hoping to see those uh, next week. The deadline is November 16th. It's never too early to start uh, thinking about this process and start working on uh, the ideas that you have for presenting yourself as a viable candidate. The semifinalists are notified in January or February, and then award notification is in March. Uh, if uh, 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 the original awardees decline, there are alternates, and those alternates will be promoted in March to May. And then the pre-departure orientation, as I said, that you attend in Washington, D.C., which is mandatory, uh, is in June. So uh, what does it take to be a strong candidate for a CLS uh, scholarship? Uh, obviously, your academic record, the proof that you can be successful uh, in the classroom, uh, particularly in a rigorous academic setting. So if you've done any kind of um, immersion programs before, if you're a student in Barrett, the Honors College, and you've been through the human event or classes that are extremely rigorous like that, you can demonstrate that kind of rigor. You have to show that you're committed to this uh, particular language, right? That again, there's a strong and compelling reason for you to study it and that there's a connection between the language that you're studying and your ultimate long-term uh, goals. You also need to demonstrate that you have the kind of resiliency and flexibility to be able to adapt to an intensive program environment. As I said, lots and lots of time in the classroom as well as being fully immersed in a uh, foreign culture. Uh, and that your uh, ultimate goals are to contribute somehow to the world, to US interests, uh, less uh, kind of strictly like US security interests the way the born is, and more broadly as sort of uh, helping the world uh, in, a, in a more um, sort of ambassadorial or diplomatic way. Before I move on, um, I do want to address kind of the elephant in the room. Um, will you get to go if you win one of these scholarships? I don't know. <laughs> so um, the future is uncertain, of course. We're talking about pretty, pretty long time scales. I mean, if you're applying for CLS now, we're talking about the summer of 2022. If you're applying for Boren, you're talking about summer or fall of 2022 or spring of 2023. Um, all of this really depends on determinations of um, the pandemic trends in the host countries, US Department of State travel warnings. Um, in many cases, and, I, and Dr. Stock, correct me, I don't know if they did this for all the CLS languages, but you know, most of the CLS languages hosted virtual um, cohorts. And so the language training still occurred, it just didn't have the on the ground experience many of the BORIN programs persisted um, virtually as well when we we're going through the worst part of the pandemic. So it's a good news, bad news kind of thing. And CLS actually continues to offer virtual programs. Uh, so they have already established this kind of structure. 
uh, that will allow you to do, they've, they implemented some programs even during the academic year that you can do, and they have a, a refresher course for CLS alum that also is a virtual program so that you can brush up on your language skills after you finish the program. Yep, it's a new program, it's very cool. So um, we also want to emphasize a couple of the other fellowships with which we work that do provide additional funding or training uh, for critical languages. Uh, one program that we do a lot of work with is the Gilman Scholarship, which is another Department of State uh, scholarship that provides up to $5,000 to support uh, undergraduate students to go on study abroad. It's very simple. Um, it's open specifically to Pell Grant recipients, but they also do offer an additional $3,000 bonus award for those uh, students who are doing study abroad for language training. So if you're going to study to do some critical language training, you can get an additional $3,000, so a potential up to $8,000. Uh, it's a very straightforward application. We have an advisor uh, direct uh, who works specifically with that in partnership with our study abroad office. Uh, the Fulbright program is a postgraduate award, meaning that you'd have to have a bachelor's degree before you leave to go, which means that the soonest you could apply for Fulbright is as you're heading into your graduation year, fourth year, senior year. Um, obviously, with over 150 countries to choose from, language study can be a huge component of your proposal. Um, you can apply to go as an English teacher abroad, and while you're there, continue to study language. You can go uh, to conduct study or research, either formally or informally. Um, and of course, language study can be a component of that. There are a limited number of countries that do provide additional support for what they call critical language enhancement awards. And that means pre-departure language study and additional funding um, to make sure that you have you know, sufficient language. So we have somebody applying this year, for instance, to go study um, something very scientific in Northern India, uh, bioreactors, meaning uh, biological mechanisms that can help promote the growth of certain organisms. So she's really interested in these certain herbs that grow in Northern India. But even as a bioengineer, she wants to do the critical language enhancement work because she knows it'll enhance her overall experience. So you don't necessarily have to be somebody who's already proficient and make this an add-on to what's already a wonderful experience. Uh, if you're interested in Asian languages, there's a program called Blakemore Freeman, which exists specifically to assist people with angu uh, Asian language training. Um, including, of course, more mainstream ones like Chinese and Japanese, but also um, less, much less commonly taught ones like Thai, Khmer, uh, Burmese, right? Uh, it's open to graduating seniors or recent graduates. Um, you must already be at a fairly advanced level, so um, that might be a little difficult with some of those languages, but it's a wonderful program. I've had students do it in the past, um, and it's very generous. Um, we'd also like to, to roll in here, even though these are not external awards, these are externally funded opportunities that exist at ASU. So if you're here today, um, the premise, uh, the assumption from us is that you are interested in studying one of these critically undertaught languages, and therefore there are additional resources here at ASU that might interest you. Uh, Dr. Stoff is an affiliated faculty member with the Malikian Institute, so I'll let her talk more about the Critical Languages Institute, which is a wonderful program. So this is actually an amazing opportunity that you have um, here, right here uh, at ASU. Uh, the Critical Languages Institute is one of only two Title VI uh, funded program, or Title VIII, excuse me, funded programs uh, in the country that uh, offers all of these amazing languages. Um, so it is uh, a project of the Malikian Center for Russian, Eurasian, and East European Studies, although the languages that they offer are broader even than the, the regions that Malikian um, researches. Uh, as I said, it's a national training institute, uh, and it's giving students the opportunity to study a variety of different languages at various levels. So you can study Hebrew, Polish, and Tatar. This Tatar is new. Uh, uh, first year, first and second year, you can take Albanian, Macedonian, Persian, Turkish, Ukrainian, and Uzbek. Uh, first, second, and third and above, Armenian, uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, that's BCS, uh, Indonesian, Russian, and now we have a new program in Kazakh. These are all, again, uh, very important languages for uh, national security interests. 
And we do fund uh, students who attend. First of all, for ASU students, uh, you can attend the uh, Critical Languages Institute tuition free. Uh, you just have to pay uh, for the housing uh, um, room and board, essentially. Um, but they also, for the programs here at ASU, the, the several of the programs have the ability to travel to host countries to study the Russians after or study the languages after um, you take the coursework here at ASU. And for those, we offer uh, a variety of scholarship opportunities, stipends ranging um, between fifteen hundred to six thousand um, dollars. Applications are due for this in January, and there is going to be a dedicated info session on Critical Languages Institute on October 6, which you can register uh, through the Malikian Center website. One of the other federally funded uh, uh, language programs here at ASU is the Chinese flagship program. And essentially what it is, is a multi-year program where you can pursue your normal course of study and then add on top of that um, a, a plan to develop professional level proficiency in Chinese. And it includes uh, international study, summer study, language study as part of the program. And then it has a capstone year requirement, which is 50% uh, language study and then 50% professional internship in China. For the last two years, there's been some flexibility there and, and students have gone uh, to, to, to Langley uh, here in the United States to do their language training or their capstone year because travel to China wasn't wasn't um, allowed at that time. Um, and yeah, the Boren scholarship can be used to fund that capstone year, which is obviously, um, you know, as a fifth year of study is an expense and their rate of success is quite high for that. Um, they recently changed the program entrance to a rolling admissions process. And so again, it, it's um, their information is housed within the School of International Letters and Cultures. Really wonderful program, wonderful people to work with. Um, and we've been a great partner of theirs as well. Both of these programs, um, it, it, it's difficult to really appreciate how uncommon they are nationally. Um, it's very rare to attend a large state university that has these sorts of well-funded language programs. And so ASU students are quite fortunate in that. And uh, one final program I'll mention that we do have great resources for at ASU are the uh, FLAS or Foreign Language Area Studies Fellowships. These are another, this is another federally funded program uh, here at ASU, uh, the application process is administered by the Center for Asian Research. And so the target languages, therefore, are Asian languages, um, if you're going to apply through, um, for class funding through ASU. And so as you can imagine, you could, you could get multiples of these different awards. We have students who have done CLS and then Boren and then Fulbright or done a FLAS and then Boren or done CLI and then Boren and Fulbright. There's a lot of different combinations of all these different awards. And in fact, the more of them you get, the more likely you are to get later ones because they actually do take that into consideration. So you don't have to pick and choose, but maybe strategize about when you'll do which award and in what order. So... So um, our website um, has a lot of resources available on there. there. There is a modest database that you can look at if you haven't um, been there already. Uh, you can see other upcoming information sessions uh, available this semester and soon next semester. Um, and as well, if you haven't subscribed to our um, informational bulletin, we send it out once a week and it just contains information about upcoming deadlines, uh, other info sessions. Um, and um, here at our website, you can also find information on how to book appointments. You can book appointments with us virtually. Uh, you don't need to email us and say, are you available next Thursday at three o'clock? You can just go online and, and schedule yourself an appointment. And we do offer uh, virtual appointments, phone appointments. And um, I don't know if Dr. Stoff is doing in-person appointments, but um, I can do those on request as well. Um, there's our email addresses. So if you have questions about um, Boren or any of the other major programs, email me. Uh, if you have questions about Critical Languages Scholarship, which is due sooner, uh, email Dr. Stoff and uh, we can take it from there. Um, one question in the chat and then we'll open it up to Q&A. But yeah, exactly right. There's no limit uh, to any of these, right? These are all operating independently of each other. Um, they're not restricting you in any kind of way to what you, to what you can apply for. And as I said, uh, when you sit down to apply for uh, a Fulbright, for instance, there's actually a question that says, have you received any of the following awards? And they'll list Gilman, 
Lauren, Critical Languages Scholarship, LAS, um, and so on and so forth. So they, they look at that quite favorably if you've um, shown that level of seriousness that you've gone after multiple different language training awards. So great. All right, let me pause there um, and see what kind of questions you have that we could answer here today. You're welcome to un unmute yourself and just pop it out there, or if you're the shyer sort, you can put it in the chat. Angus has a question. Go for it, Angus. Uh, I had a question regarding, uh, I wrote it earlier, the CLS scholarship. I wrote, is it, is it uh, proficient, not proficiency, eligibility measured to now or before we begin, by the time we begin? For example, uh, I'm about to finish my second year of Japanese in spring. So I'm wondering, am I allowed to apply now or am I unable to apply for that? Yeah, I tried to answer that for you uh, in the chat, Angus, but yes, it's it's measured from the time uh, that the program begins. So if you're going to have your second year of Japanese under your belt by the summer, then uh, you can apply. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I had a quick question. Yeah, I'll make a separate appointment as well, but... Um, Regarding some of the shorter term uh, fellowship opportunities, like for the summer, mm -hmm. I did previously ask, and uh, we're currently unsure if um, uh, the, cr the critical language scholarships offer an extension after a language study to stay in the country, but are we aware of any opportunities that would allow you to stay for a longer duration um, uh, of time? And if not, how can we get that mm -hmm. information? Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in longer term study, Boren is really your best option because they have a strong preference for longer proposals. Um, we have also seen applicants who have applied concurrently for CLS and Boren or CLS and Fulbright, and then they did their CLS in the country and then just stayed there and started their Fulbright or started their Boren term. Um, right. I even think that Maria Dueling, who did Arabic, I remember. She applied for Boren and Fulbright, and I'm trying to remember how all this worked out. Um, she applied for Boren to go study Arabic in Jordan, and she applied for Fulbright to teach English in Malaysia, and she got both. And she's like, okay, what do I do? I'm like, write Boren and ask if you can change your dates. And she did, and she moved her dates up. So she was able to do the Arabic study starting in summer through December, and then the academic year in Malaysia begins in January, so she was able to pull off both. And so they want you to take up these awards and they want you to be in country. And so um, if we're talking specifically just about CLS, this, these are always situations where we just reach out right to them. Uh, Dr. Stoff and I know the people at these programs. We just shoot them an email and we get an answer usually in the same day. Um, I've observed reading committees for all of these awards. I've been on a reading committee for CLS, I think. Dr. Stoff has too, has read for CLS in the past. So we know what, what's involved in the process and there's a very you know, open and, and honest line, line of communication between us and the fellowship. So anything that we can't answer, uh, we'll certainly be able to answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just really quickly jump in and answer Noah's question here in the chat. The, the CLS program, is, is fully funded. You don't have to apply it separately for funding. You, everything gets paid for if you're accepted into the program. Yep. Hi, um, hi. I, I'm not sure I understand well about Boren uh, Fellowship. Um, is it funding just to study the language or to do language re related research? The primary emphasis of the program is for language acquisition. Okay. Yeah. That and that and whatever else you're doing, as long as there's demonstrable language acquisition happening, um, that's fine. For the Boren Fellowship at the graduate level, that's where people can design a program. They can do a research program as long as there is a there's a strong emphasis on language study itself. If that makes sense. Okay, and this additional question, my situation is I am a citizen, I'm a native speaker of Serbo-Croatian, but I'm also doing Russian. Mm -hmm. So if I want to apply uh, to do a research to do for Russian language acquisition, can I apply to go to some other Russian speaking country, not yeah. to Russia? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you'd have a better chance of doing Russian since it would be a, a 
second, third, or fourth language, you know, not a pro not your primary language. Um, and that, yeah, we've seen things like that before as well. Um, you reminded me of a good comment for me to, to mention in terms of Russian study for Boren. Um, one of the major differences between Russian study in CLS and Russian study in Boren is where the money is coming from. So CLS is a Department of State program, and you will, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Stuff, but I think one of the language centers is still in St. Petersburg. That's correct. Yeah. Well, the De Department of Defense cannot spend any money in Russia. So you can't at present, and I don't know if things will improve anytime soon, but so if you want to study Russia as a topic, you can write about that in your application, but you have to put down a plan B, right? It, knowing full well that your plan A to study in Russia is never going to happen. Um, and so that puts us in kind of a weird situation where maybe the student is focused on, say, Russian history or, or uh, Russian current events or something like that, and they want to write their application about Russia, knowing that they'll probably end up in, in Lithuania or, or, or one of the other Russian-speaking countries. Um, or, you know, you can focus on, a, on another Russian-speaking country besides Russia as your primary point of emphasis. So that it's a little weird uh, because of that, that restriction. Um, so that's one thing that we can talk through for those of you that are considering Russian. Yeah, and this is actually, uh, it's relevant to CLS as well as to CLI, because actually for the first and second year students who are studying Russian and want to do this, the study abroad component, they do not get sent to Russia, they get sent to Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, because the Department of Defense cannot uh, fund any students going there. In upper level, uh, third and fourth year and beyond, uh, there is opportunity to go to Russia. For CLI, it will be St. Petersburg. For CLS, it will be Nizhny Novgorod or Vladimir. Um, so it all, yes, it all depends on the pots of money, like where, where it's coming from. So you could easily propose a, a course of study in another country that has, you know, significant Russian speaking opportunities, you know, and, and that would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Yeah, I, I just, I'm just asking, I'm, I, I really want to go to Russia and, and learn, but I, I don't feel like going to Russia right now, um, considering the situation, to be honest. Yeah. Can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and that brings up a good point as well. In that you know, many and because many of these places are underrepresented in, in typical study abroad. Part of what you need to demonstrate as an applicant is that you are up for that, right? That you're open to being in a challenging or maybe less comfortable situation. Or uh, if you want to go, you know, do Bahasa Indonesian, that. You're, you're ready for a non-Western experience. And so adaptability, flexibility, open-mindedness, cross-cultural capabilities are all important for all of these. Um, I think Dallin had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask about the Boren Scholarship. Um, this, I said the service requirement has to be completed within three years of graduation, is that correct? Three years of completing your education. So if you decide to go on to graduate school right after undergraduate, you wouldn't, the clock wouldn't have started yet. So even, so it would be three years after like a master's program, say, or, or graduate yep. program. Yep. Okay. And can you get the scholarship and do a fellowship with Boren too, as a grad, like undergraduate and then graduate, or is that not possible? Uh, I believe it is. I have to double check on that one, but I believe it is. Um, Oddly enough, you can also apply for both the scholarship and the fellowship at the same time. Let's say you're a graduating senior and you're also at this point applying for graduate schools. You could apply for both with the assumption that you've gotten an agreement from your, you know, your graduate program that they're going to let you go abroad in your first year. Um, so you know that, that can be a challenge, but you can apply for both. The selection rates for the graduate fellowship are quite good, uh, about a third, uh, which is... Um, uh, above what it is for the scholarship. So any graduate students here, I really encourage you to, to consider that. Okay, uh, thank you. Sorry. And then, sorry, real quick. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so would it be possible, I know this is kind of specific, but like if uh, someone graduated and then took a year in between and then did a graduate study or something like that, is that, does it still like work for doing the service requirement after oh, that? Oh yeah, you know, and they're gonna work with you. They don't, they don't wanna be the bad people here. Um, as long as they're aware of what you're doing and you're making a conscious effort moving, you know, and 
could be like, yeah, I still want to work for the Department of State. I'm just going to get my master's degree 